Hello, and welcome to this service of worship. It's good that you're here. Today we have a guest preacher. He is Matt Moncrief, Minister of Spiritual Formation at our neighbor church, Canyon Hills Presbyterian Church. He's in the ordination process to become a pastor in the PCUSA. And uh, in the asynchronous nature of our world these days, I have just heard him deliver an amazing sermon. So fasten your seatbelts because you're about to get a wonderful word from God, faithful to our scriptures. For communion this morning, our friend Reverend Jason McKelly will be hosting at the table and guiding us through the liturgy today. It's going to be a beautiful worship service so that it, it's good that you are here. As you're watching this on Sunday, you can anticipate me being back in the office tomorrow, Monday morning. We have some big events coming up in the life of the church, two of them that I want to highlight for you right now. The first is our Youth Ministry Vision Summit. That will be happening this coming weekend, November 6th through the 8th. We've got uh, folks from Ministry Architects coming to guide us through a fun and invigorating process that will help us hone our mission statement for our youth ministry, set some core values for that program, and also lay out some goals and benchmarks of success. I've been telling you for a while that a lot of work has been going on behind the scenes, and this is a chance for our parents and our youth and anyone else who's interested to hear the results of that work and participate in the process of building what is to come. We've been communicating directly with our families, both the parents and the kids, but anyone from the congregation who has a heart for our youth is welcome to participate in this process. We had great turnout the last time, and so I want to encourage anybody who wants to, just contact the church office and we'll make sure that you can be a part of those conversations, some of which will be happening virtually for those who feel safer participating from home, others which will be happening here on campus with safe physical distancing. We're really looking forward to sharing our progress with you and having you be a part of building what is to come for our youth ministry. Finally, November is Mission Month. That's been our practice for the last couple of years, and the Mission Committee has done some really creative work planning how we can honor that tradition and do what is so vital to our mission work together in a different way this year. There won't be an alternative Christmas market, but there will be lots of opportunities for you to participate in the mission of the church. We're gonna have another touchless drive-by drop-off on Saturday, November 15th, from 14th from 9 to noon and in that drop-off you can support several different of our mission partners you can bring toilet paper diapers and wipes for your belinda food for pan families you can bring hygiene items which our youth group will gather into hygiene kits those are going to go to the folks at citynet uh, organization that's been supporting homeless people throughout Orange County. And Julie McKelly is actually serving as an intern there at CityNet, and we're so glad to have that direct connection with a nonprofit that has been doing some very good work in Orange County with folks who are homeless. So hygiene items for CityNet. Also, you can reserve and purchase tamales. That'll be a fundraiser for that hygiene mission project. And finally, we will have a giving tree. We're gonna do that a little differently this year, but you'll have an opportunity to take an ornament from the giving tree and purchase a gift for residents of his house, both the home in Placentia, where their families with children, and the new home on Franklin House that's housing college students. Lots more details to come, but I wanted to get you ready for what's happening in Mission Month. And now, let us prepare our hearts to worship the God who loves the world God made. Good morning, children of God. Old family albums are fun to look through. It's nice to remember family members who have passed. And looking through mine, I found pictures of my grandmother. We used to spend summers at our house in Georgia, and she loved us a lot, and she made the best banana pudding. And her brother Felton was my great uncle, and he gave the best hugs. He would bring his candy and little paper bags, you know, I love to look at the old albums so I can remember people I used to know and even see pictures of family members who have died before I was born. Today is All Saints Day. It's a day when we remember the family of God that has gone before us. St. Peter, St. Paul, 
and others that we read about in the Bible, as well as many other men and women of God who were disciples of Jesus Christ down through the ages. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are all part of the family of God. The Bible is a book about members of the family of God that goes back many, many, many years. We read about Abraham, who had great trust in God. And there's Moses, who led the people out of slavery in Egypt. And we can read about God's son, Jesus, and about the disciples, John, James, Peter, and others. We call them saints, and saints are people who have been set apart for God's holy or special purposes. In a sense, we are all saints, but we like to especially remember the disciples because they knew Jesus and were the first to follow him. These saints that are mentioned in the Bible are really part of our family, the family of God. So you see that the Bible is like our family photo album. It tells the story of the great men and women of faith and the family of God, the same faith family that we belong to. And all God's children say, Amen. Listen to the word of the Lord. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he, then he said to me, 
These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, everybody. Uh, as Pastor Lynn introduced, my name is Matt Moncrief. Uh, I am the Minister of Spiritual Formation at Canyon Hills Presbyterian Church, and I would just like to say that this is the fulfillment of a, a long time coming aspiration of mine. Uh, Pastor Lynn had asked me to come and, and, and deliver a message on a Sunday morning right at the beginning of this pandemic, and having that be postponed because suddenly the world decided not to cooperate with my plans uh, was really inconvenient. But I am just overjoyed that I get the opportunity to come uh, and, and speak to you today. Um, today, the, the, the passage, the scripture that we have out of Revelations uh, is one that is, is kind of odd for me a little bit. I have, I have mixed feelings about Revelation, uh, partially coming out of my own experience uh, in youth group where uh, we had this, uh, this, this saying uh, when I was in youth group and then I transitioned into leading youth group shortly after that, that, uh, that there's only really three messages that, that youth want to hear. Um, and that's uh, the end times, love, sex, and dating, and love, sex, and dating in the end times. And that is it. That's the core of youth ministry. Um, and so I, 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 I uh, but as I was looking at the verse for today and saying, God, don't let me teach Revelation. Uh, God said, teach Revelation. And so that's what I'm doing today. But in order to understand Revelation and in order to understand this verse for today, I'm going to first have to teach you about something that is totally out of left field, totally uh, unexpected, something that you did not anticipate learning today. And that is is Zoroastrianism. Now, why do we need to learn about Zoroastrianism? You just got to hold on with me until the end, because I promise it comes back to mean something. Uh, but, but first, our primer on Zoroastrianism. So Zoroastrianism is a, uh, a, a, an ancient uh, competing religion with both Judaism and Christianity. So it, it, it kind of pops up around the time of the Assyrian exile for the Israelites, um, and then it goes through all the early times of Christianity because we, we have Islam popping up a couple hundred years later, but, but in those early days of Christianity, Zoroastrianism was the primary major religion competitor to Christianity. And so you might see some similarities, and I want you to think as we go through this, what are the similarities that you see between Christianity um, and Zoroastrianism? So here we go. At the very beginning, uh, it features a dualistic cosmology. So there is a good God, an uncreated, supremely good God, in contrast to a purely evil devil, Satan. And so God has God's angels, uh, the devil has the demons, and these two forces oppose each other in the world. And... Um, they were to follow a threefold path. So the primary teaching of Zoroastrian was this threefold path. And it was good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. That it's by, by doing this good that, that we align ourselves with the good forces and oppose the evil forces. And this was the idea that we were to be good just for goodness's sake, that, that we weren't supposed to expect any so, sort of reward or, or, or compensation for this goodness, that it was just in order to somehow move the needle in that cosmic battle between good and evil, that our actions were participant in that. And, and by being good and opposing evil, we would somehow move the needle of that cosmic battle. And most importantly for today, we need to understand how in Zoroastrianism everything ends. So I'm going to read you a, a little bit from a Zoroastrian Veda, one of their scriptures. And it says this, At the end of the 10th, 100th winter... 
The sun will be more unseen and spotted. The year and month and days would be shorter and the earth would be more barren. The crop would not yield seed and men will become more deceitful and given to more vile practices. They will have no gratitude. Honorable wealth will proceed to those of perverted faith and it will rain more noxious creatures than water. And at that time, at that moment... It describes a great final battle between the righteous and the wicked, followed immediately by the Savior coming down from heaven and the resurrection of the dead. And then the angels would melt all the metal in the hills and it would flow down like lava and all of creation, all of the dead that have been resurrected, all of the angels and the demons and everything would have to walk through this river of lava towards paradise. And and if you were a righteous person aligned with the goodness of God, then it would just feel like warm milk to you. That's how they describe it, warm milk. And if you weren't, then you would be swept along with it down to the depths of hell. And there, finally, this lava would destroy the devil, all of the demons, all of the wicked people that had ever lived. And and, and then at that point, uh, those who managed to walk through the lava, the righteous, would live forever without hunger or thirst or war or injury. And bodies, the bodies of those people would become so light that they would cast no shadow and all humanity would speak a single language and belong to a single nation with no borders and all would share in a single purpose and a single goal joining with God for a perpetual and divine exaltation. So what do we see in common between Christianity and this pagan alternative? We see a good God. We see a redeeming Christ figure. We see an ultimate uh, time where all creation is joined together. But what is different, what is different is probably the most important. From our scripture that we read this morning versus the scripture from the Zoroastrian Veda, what is the difference? I want to point it out to you. In Zoroastrianism, the final result is not diversity. The final result is all people losing their distinctions, losing their differences, becoming so light that they don't cast a shadow, becoming just light, all becoming one nation, all becoming one purpose of mind. But how is our God's kingdom on this earth the final end of who we are to be, the final goal of the kingdom of God. It's not shown in those languages. It's not shown in those terms. What we see is people from all tribe, from every nation, from every sort of division on this planet, every language, every color, every creed, joined together with a common purpose. Not becoming a common purpose, not losing the things that make us distinct, not somehow God deciding that the ultimate goal of this world, the ultimate reality of the kingdom of God is sameness. It's not. The ultimate reality of the kingdom of God is a unity of diversity pointing to a higher reason for being, a higher cause and purpose, a higher reality and love and peace and joy, one that we simply cannot find in our dividedness and in our separation. But it's not an eradication of those things. And why is it important to understand Zoroastrian? Why is it important to to, to, to spend time looking at that? Because it's so easy in our modern sense to gloss over what it was about Christianity that made it so unique. What made it so special? What made it stand out from its contemporaries in the first century? What made Christianity live on 
into the modern world while all these other theologies disappeared. It's not the things that it shares in common. Because if it was the commonalities between Christianity and Zoroastrianism, the good God and the evil devil, the final battle, all these things, if it was those things that made Christianity special and important and unique, then why not? Why, why aren't we all Zoroastrians? Why, why didn't Zoroastrian live? It is the things that Christianity stands apart. It is the ways that Christianity was distinct from its contemporaries that give us the reason why we exist. Because it is better that we matter in our form, in our opinions, in our own, in our own conceptualizations, that we are individually and uniquely important in the kingdom of God. And that the final reality of the kingdom of God is not an eradication of what makes you and me and everybody else in this world special, but it's the final realization that it is when we, as a group of people that are so different, so different in thought, an opinion, when we all come together, realized that it is when we are in perfect harmony, when we can unite for a higher purpose, a higher call, even though we might disagree on everything else, when we agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, when we agree that God is love, when we agree that hope rests in this future coming kingdom of God where all people come together not by setting down their opinions but by realizing that it is together that we become the kingdom of God. So what, what do we as the church need to do in this moment? What do we need to live out? What do we need to point to I think that in this moment in history, we can look to the coming kingdom of God. We can look to what it is about Christianity's coming kingdom that makes it special and unique and hold on to that because we are the ambassadors of that hope for this world. The hope that we all someday, even in disagreement and difference and division and separation, will someday point to something bigger than those and come together. That we'll find a path that includes harmony. But what if we lose our diversity of thought? In the church? What if we lose our diversity of, of age and, and, and political uh, orientation and, and, and age and, and, and color? What, what if we lose that diversity in the church? We stop being a reflection of the eschatological kingdom of God. If we allow these divisions to come into the church, we have not only lost diversity in the worldly church, but we have stopped pointing to the true and coming kingdom of Jesus Christ in the world. We have lost what it means to be the church that points to the coming hope of Jesus Christ. There is so much more at stake to maintaining peace and unity, and love, and respect, maintaining the status of children of God, that we can acknowledge our brothers and sisters and fellows in the church in that way. There's so much more at stake than just losing those things for the present earthly kingdom of God. We're actually losing our ability to point to the future. We're losing our ability to plant our feet on the hope of the coming Christ whose kingdom changes our attitudes about those things. So obviously there's some stuff at stake here in this moment in time with this verse. It's important that we remember who we are as the church and what our purpose is to reflect like in a mirror dimly, to use Paul's words, what is possible 
in Christ Jesus. That there is hope for someday this unity and peace and harmony to come to this world. And that Jesus will be bringing it. Peter says that uh, it's, it was his desire for us to see ourselves as resident aliens in this world. That ultimately we would consider ourselves first and foremost citizens of the coming kingdom of God. That we live in the present and future kingdom of God when we come and gather as the church. None of us are perfect, yet together it is our purpose as the church to point to that kingdom and give hope for the people outside of the church that that sort of reality might someday be possible. It seems impossible in the terms of the world to build bridges across the divisions that we've created for ourselves. But we believe that Jesus Christ is able. We believe that the kingdom of God that has been established in the church reflects that kind of healing. So right now, our testimony as the church, not just your Belinda Presbyterian Church, not just Canyon Hills Presbyterian Church, not just the Presbyterian Church, not just, you know, whatever divisions of the church that we think, our mission as the church in the world is to align our testimony in such a way that we hold together in unity, even if everything else falls apart. That the East and West and male and female and slave and free all exist, but the divisions that come from those have been undone in Jesus Christ. And that we are the citizens of that kingdom that we see in Revelation in this world right now which points to the ultimate peace and justice and happiness that someday we will see when that kingdom is realized in its fullness. But we need to point to that kingdom now, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all to the table today. Let us pray. Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught and healed. We glorify you for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made us a new people by water and spirit. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Help us, O God, to love as Christ loved. Knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all those who stumble. Sharing in his suffering, may we remember all those who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all whom the world denies. We ask in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body that has been given for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you eat and eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord and Savior until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you have filled us with your life. Christ our Savior, you have embraced us in your love. God our Father, you have fed us with your grace. Now send us out into your beloved world to share your life, your love, your grace with all. Blessing and honor and glory to you. Amen. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to live as citizens of that future coming kingdom of God. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>